Kit. So Jazz Conway is a PhD student with Professor Kerry Howell and Professor Matthew Upton at the University of Plymouth. She's working to mine novel natural products from marine environments with the aim to characterize the microbiome of diverse marine environments, develop cultivation methods for previously uncultivable microorganisms, as well as identify novel antimicrobials produced by isolates. Um, so over to you, Jazz. Great, thank you. Um, so as said, yeah, I'm Jazz. Um, I'm a first year PhD student at the University of Plymouth. Um, my supervisors are Professor Matthew Upton, Professor Kerry Howe and Professor Rosie Dorrington, and I'm investigating deep sea sponges as a potential for novel antimicrobial compounds. Okay, so Streptomyces originated around 400 million years ago and are adapted to suit almost every environment on Earth, so from high mountains to the deep depths of the sea. They also harbour a very large compound, quadruple the size. Uh, they also harbour a very large genome quadruple the size of some other bacteria, enabling the production of many secondary metabolites. It is thought that the evolutionary history, selected pressures from the environment and the large genome can explain their capacity to produce many secondary metabolites. Streptomyces on average produce over 30 secondary metabolites, however only one to three of these are discovered thus far. They are usually secreted as a response to adverse environments and are used to increase their competitive advantage over other species. It's these secondary metabolites that often have bioactive abilities, so anti-tumor, anti-helminthic, anti-parasitic, uh, parasitic, and antimicrobial. So it's these secondary metabolites from the streptomyces that are currently responsible for around 50% of clinically relevant antibiotics on the market. The vast potential of this genus is only just becoming to be shown with the use of whole genome sequencing and laboratory cultivation under various conditions. However, in terms of bioactive compounds, the high rediscovery rate of already known compounds has created a bit of a bottleneck within the natural discovery pipeline. So how do we address this issue? The search for natural products has recently taken a dive into the water. With the use of new technologies such as ROVs, we're able to explore the depths of the sea and explore the potential for novel products in new environments. The deep sea is known as one of the harshest environments on earth. It has little light, low level of oxygen, high salinity, and is a high pressure environment. All of these create unique selective pressures requiring all life forms to be well adapted to the environment in order to survive and reproduce. These selective pressures can influence the secondary metabolite produced, resulting in new potent antimicrobials and lower rates of discovery, rediscovery. Recent analysis has highlighted how the deep sea is one of the most diverse and species rich habitats on the planet, while simultaneously being the least explored, creating scope for novel species and novel compounds to be discovered. Sea sponges in particular are sessile benthic animals and very efficient filter feeders. Incredibly, they can filter 50,000 times their own body volume within just one day. This leaves them regularly exposed to debris, predation and pathogens. In order to protect themselves from such threats, they secrete secondary metabolites. In fact, of these secondary metabolites are produced by the symbiotic bacteria living within the sponges. They're capable of secreting a whole plethora of chemicals as a survival strategy. These compounds are high, secreted in high concentration to enable them to be effective when diluted with seawater and have pharmaceutical potential. So much so that deep sea sponges have become known as a drug treasure trove house. So, the phylum actinobacteria tend to be one of the most commonly found phylum within deep sea sponges. As earlier explained, streptomyces are a genus of this phylum, and so focusing on cultivating them is a good starting place to find new potential compounds. Um, I began by placing out 11 ferronema samples onto various agar medium, some high nutrient, other low nutrient, and some selective nutrients. This was in order to cultivate as many diverse isolates as possible. Agar such as R2A, MA, ACT, half concentrated R2A, ISP2, SCA and oatmeal agar were employed and plates incubated for a total of 12 weeks, being checked every two weeks. So far, a total of 100 isolates have been screened for bioactive potential, and of those, four have shown activity towards common escape pathogens. This has been and identified through the use of cross streaks and overlay assays, agar overlay assays. The cross streak consisted of testing common escape pathogens, both Gram negative and gram positive, M. lucius, Staph aureus, E. faecalis, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, and Acinetobacter baumanniae. Agar overlays were done with M. lucius as the pathogen of choice. So the characteristics um, 
One isolate of particular interest was a gram-positive actinomycete, showing activity towards gram-positive pathogens, MVTS, Staph aureus, MRSA, and E. faecalis. This isolate is non-motile, spore-forming actinobacteria. Initially, it grows showing white mycelium and then becomes gray when forming spores. Carbon utilization tests revealed it exhibited no preference towards a carbon source and grows on all ISP1 to ISP5 agar, both in liquid and in culture. So the species was identified through the use of 16S RNA analysis to be a Streptomyces microflavus. This species is known to produce the antibiotics nemodectin and milbomycin, an antiviral compound fativaricin A1. It is commonly found within soil samples and has also been known to be isolated from a sea sponge previously. A DNA extraction was carried out using a power saw DNA extraction kit and quality checked using a qubit before being sent for whole genome sequencing. On analysis of the genome sin, uh, through anti-smash and using various thresholds from Bernal de Tau, I was able to identify eight biosynthetic gene clusters that have potential to secrete novel compounds. Overall, 41 biosynthetic gene clusters were identified. Of those, 21 were NRPSs and PKSs. NRPSs and PKSs are able to create secondary metabolites in response to stressful conditions, and these are widely used as drugs today. Often, BGCs can be referred to as silent. This is when the product of the BGC is not expressed in laboratory conditions. The BGC can, product can be estimated through comparisons with other species that do, not, that do express, express the compound through cloning or through attempts to trigger the expression of the compound. Due to the nature of streptomyces and their capability to produce many secondary metabolites, an OSMAC was carried out to determine the optimal culture conditions for bioactivity in an attempt to trigger any of these silent BGCs. Just briefly, as Grant has already explained, an OSMAC is an approach where a multitude of variables are assessed in order to determine the best conditions to grow a species in for the largest zones of inhibition. I address several parameters and intend to continue OSMAC experiments in an attempt to encourage further secondary metabolite production. On analysis of Streptomyces microflavus, I assess static versus non-static, various media components, growth time, and the size of Erlenmeyer flasks for optimal activity to be determined. This was then determined through a well diffusion assay. I was able to determine that a flask with 250 mils shaking and left for 14 days in three different types of a media gave the largest zones of inhibition. A preliminary test was carried out using medias ISP1 and ISP5. The two media showed the largest zones of inhibition. The OSMAC culture conditions were employed and the supermatant tested for after 14 days. A liquid liquid extraction was undertaken to separate into polar and non-polar compounds. As you can see in the photo above, the ethyl acetate phase showed the greatest zone of inhibition, but this was only, as this was only preliminary, I didn't have enough compound to continue down the antimicrobial pipeline. So, having confirmed activity, I then isolated, I then inoculated 14 flasks and left them to incubate. I then tested them for supernatant activity, and all active flasks were pulled and a liquid liquid extraction carried out. It was unfortunately at this point that the activity seemed to be lost. Um, since then, I've inoculated into other media that originally showed evidence of activity and from the OSMAC, and that has also shown a loss of activity. Therefore, in an attempt to increase or trigger larger zones of inhibition, ribosome engineering was employed. Antibiotic gradient plates from zero to 100 mic micrograms per mil were created and the streptomyces isolates were streaked across the plate. Once inoculated, the plate was left to incubate until the control plate without antibiotics had formed a fully confluent line across the agar. At this point, an estimation of the MIC was determined. A more accurate value was then inferred through creating antibiotic plates of concentrations above and below the predicted MIC values. Concentrations 3, 10, and 30 fold higher than the MIC value was then plated out and inoculated in the hope that mutant strains would grow. Currently, the ribosome engineering plates are incubating. However, there are already signs of growth. The higher the concentration of antibiotic the, the isolate is able to grow on, the potentially more stable the mutant. These mutants will then be assessed for antimicrobial capability, and I also intend to return to the OSMAC studies in order to attempt to re-stimulate the production of the antimicrobial compounds. Thank you very much for listening.